continuing on with our discussion of Java condition objects and condition variables, which are the concepts that underlie them, we're going to take a little bit more of a detour and talk about another concept that's crucially important to understanding how condition variables and condition objects work. And that concept or that pattern is the guarded suspension pattern. And you'll get a chance to understand what pattern are implemented by condition variables and, and Java condition objects. So condition variables are very, very commonly used to implement something called the guarded suspension pattern. And you can read about this pattern here at this link. You can also read about it in the Pattern Oriented Software Architecture Volume 4 book. And the, basically, in, in a nutshell, what this pattern says is, in order to be able to execute an operation, you need to have both a lock to be acquired, like a rentrant lock, for example, and a precondition to be satisfied. And until both of those things are true, until you have the lock and until the precondition is satisfied, you can't make any progress. So that's why it's guarded suspension. You, you suspend yourself until things go the way you want. And this pattern is applied to operations that can only run when a particular condition is satisfied. So we have some operation, we're going to so you DQ something from a, from a bounded buffer, we're going to NQ something into a bounded buffer, and we want to make sure that we've either got an item to DQ or there's space in the queue to put something in the queue. And if neither of those conditions hold, we have to wait. So that, that's an example of operation processing that we might want to be ensuring is satisfied when operations, that's the operation that can only run when certain conditions are satisfied. Well, this works in the following way, and this is the guarded suspension protocol. The first thing you do is you come along and you acquire a lock. So you want to atomically access this resource. And so the way to do that, of course, is you have to acquire the lock. And if the lock is unavailable, you're gonna have to wait. If the lock is available, good for you, you've got the lock. And the thing to remember here is that a condition variable is always, always, always associated with a lock. They have to be used together. In fact, as you'll see when we get into condition objects in more detail, condition objects are always created using a factor method. Condition objects in Java, that is, are always created in conjunction with a reentrant lock. There's a factor method called new condition on reentrant lock, and it returns a condition object that you can then use in conjunction with that lock. So that's really important to remember. And the second thing that has to occur in addition to getting the lock acquiring the lock, getting exclusive access, is with exclusive access held, right, with the lock held, we check to see if the condition is satisfied. And if the condition is not satisfied, as you're going to see, we're going to wait. If the condition is satisfied, we can continue on. So the check is for while condition not satisfied, or while not condition satisfied, if you want to rewrite it more in kind of Java-esque way. So the precondition has to apply. Now, in this particular example, we're going to have a couple of threads involved in the use case. And thread T1 is going to use a condition variable and a render lock, of course, to suspend its execution until thread TN, some other thread, notifies it that shared state it's waiting for may now be satisfied, may now be satisfied. That's the key thing, may be satisfied. And this is a little bit tricky, and that's where a lot of the subtlety comes in. I'll explain that carefully as we go through it. And I like to, because I love uh, Lord of the Rings, I always think of Gandalf at the bridge at Kazak Doom saying, you shall not pass. Basically saying you, you can't continue on until the condition is satisfied. Of course, in that particular case, the, uh, there was no condition that would satisfy that, right? So that was, a, that was something that would never, never hold, but uh, you get the point. The key thing here is the tentative nature of may. So you may be notified that a condition was available, but due to the inherent non-determinism of concurrency, you may not get that resource when you're finally awakened. And we'll talk more about that. It's, it's a really subtle issue, but it, it explains the way we program condition variables and condition objects. So we acquire the lock, we keep going in a loop until the condition is satisfied. And a condition can be arbitrarily complicated. And this is one of the things that differentiates a condition object from other forms of coordination mechanisms in Java, such as a semaphore. 
A semaphore can also be used as a coordination mechanism. In fact, that's exactly what you're doing in all the B assignments that you're implementing. You're implementing something that uses a semaphore that serves as a coordinator and only allows the thread to proceed as long as there's a palantiri available. So that's what you're using for coordination. However, semaphores are very simple because they only work with counting resources, resources where count is, is the discriminator, is the differentiator. With something like condition variables and condition objects, however, you can have arbitrarily complex conditions. So you can have method calls, you can have expressions that involve shared state. In fact, even if you have method calls, inevitably under the hood, there's a condition that is involving shared mutable state that you're checking. And it can be arbitrarily complicated. And we'll see a bunch of examples of that. So don't worry, I will make this, I will reify this, I will make this real very shortly. Now, here's the kicker. You gotta remember this. This is why we do this protocol the way we do. Any state that's shared between the threads must be protected by a lock that's associated with a condition variable. So that's crucially important. And the calling thread will block possibly repeatedly in this loop while the condition is not satisfied. So as long as the condition remains unsatisfied, the calling thread will keep going back and waiting for the condition to be satisfied. Even if it was awakened at some point by another thread that thought the condition might be satisfied or, or put the state in some, uh, put some value into the state such that the condition at that point would have been satisfied. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So the way that you, the way that you block as a calling thread, if you can't get your condition satisfied is you use the await method and await does two things. It atomically releases the lock and goes to sleep on the condition. And those two things have to take place atomically. Remember, atomic means it either happens all or nothing. You're in it to win it. Now, while you're blocked, while one thread is off blocked, and, and to make this example concrete, let's assume we're trying to get an element out of a thread safe bounded buffer. So we've got something like an array blocking queue or a link blocking queue, and we're trying to take an element out of the queue. And the queue is, an, is initially empty. So obviously when the queue is empty, we're gonna have to wait. So if the condition is, you know, number of elements in the queue greater than zero, if that's the condition we're trying to wait for, while the number of elements in the queue are zero or less, I guess it could be hard to be less than zero, but if, as long as it's zero, we're gonna have to wait. And by calling a wait, we release the lock and we go to sleep. Now at some point, some other thread's gonna come along and put something into the queue in the bounded buffer. And after it does that, of course, the count will go up by one, so now there's at least one element in the queue. And it is obliged to follow the other part of the protocol here, which is the notification part. And the way that that's done with condition objects is one, some other thread, different than the, way, the one that's waiting, will signal the condition. So when it's signaled, that is an indication to any waiting threads or thread, if there's just one waiting thread, there could be multiple waiting threads, but if there's one waiting thread, signal will alert that thread that it can wake up, reacquire the lock, and then go back and recheck the condition to see whether or not it's been satisfied with the lock held. Crucially important. Remember, we only check shared state when locks are held. Now, this is where the tentative nature of may comes in, right? May be ready because it might be the case due to the non-determinism of concurrency that by the time we wake up after being signaled, we reacquire the lock, we go back around to try to, you know, get that item, that some other thread may have zipped in, stolen the resource and gone away. And so by the time we get around to checking it, when we get the lock, it may be back to zero again if we're trying to DQ something from a queue. So if that's the case, we just say, all right, well, we didn't get it this time, we'll try again soon, so we go back to sleep again on a wait. So we'll go back to waiting, which will once again atomically release the lock and suspend the thread by putting it into the set, the wait set, the queue of waiting threads. So just a bunch of things to keep in the back of your head. First of all, you can't check the condition without the lock being held. So you have to acquire the lock and there could be other threads contending for that lock. That's why you have this non-determinism aspect. And also, when a wait is called, it atomically releases the lock and goes to sleep on the 
the, on the condition variable, the condition object itself, which is this wait set of waiting threads that are trying to get their turn to see if the condition has changed. So those are the things to remember. And then when a wait returns, when you've been signaled, when a thread's been signaled, it automatically reacquires the lock before looping back around again. So we almost always use condition objects in a loop because of the non-determinism of concurrency and a wait when it's called atomically releases a lock and goes to sleep. And when it awakens, it atomically, acquire, well, it doesn't atomic, it gets the lock before it lets you loop back around again before it returns. So the way to think about this, another way to think about this is that thread T1 in this scenario is suspended until thre thread Tn signals the condition variable. And when a thread is signaled, it wakes up and must reacquire its associated lock. Now, also important here, I don't talk about this in much detail, but in order to signal a condition variable, you also have had to have acquired the lock. So you need to make sure that you hold the lock when the condition variable is signaled. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the details of this API. So after the lock is reacquired, the thread can reevaluate the condition to see if it's satisfied. And if it is, it goes on. If it's not, it waits. And only after the lock is reacquired and the condition is satisfied can the operation proceed with the lock held. And that's also very important. So it's when a wait returns, the lock is held. If we're lucky in the first time through, the condition is satisfied, the lock is still held. And so the operation processing takes place with the lock held. Now that obviously assumes some other things that are not here in evidence. It assumes facts not in evidence, as they say in depositions, which is that there must be a way to release that lock at some point. And we'll talk about that when we get further along. And it should come as no surprise to you whatsoever that you release the lock in the finally portion of a tri-finally block. Okay, so that's the end of the overview of the guarded suspension pattern. And hopefully that'll help as we start getting into the details of the condition object API, which we're getting to here shortly to understand what the heck is going on there under the hood.